Very difficult fight for Crawford. People were expecting to see the same Terrence Crawford who showed up against Earl Spence. Boxing fan logic, you know, if Terrence Crawford doesn't dominate, then he lost. People are downgrading him now in the pound for pound list. I think he still maintained the third spot. One thing for sure is I don't think he's going to take the Canelo fight anymore. Pitbull Cruz was going in as the big favorite against Rayo Valenzuela. But Rayo Valenzuela did amazing. He staying on the outside, doing lateral movements, and really neutralizing a lot of Pitbull Cruz's combinations. His kryptonite is pure slick boxers. Cruz just looked so one-dimensional. Uh, Jared Anderson was upset brutally by Martin Bacoli. He reminds me uh, to George Foreman. He's 6'6", 280. It's going to be hard for someone to stop that dude. Also, that was fight of the night. This is like 90s heavyweight type of fight, man. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of The Last Run Podcast, where we cover everything from traditional boxing to influencer boxing and everything in between. In today's episode, we'll be going over Terrence Crawford's UD win over Israel Madrimov as he conquered his fourth weight division, as well as giving our thoughts and opinion about the entirety of the card. But before we dive into the episode, make sure to like and subscribe and follow us on all forms of social media. We are on X, TikTok, and Instagram. Now diving into this week's episode, Terrence Crawford, pound for pound fighter, returned back into the ring after over a year long hiatus since his Earl Spence victory last year. Uh, he was up against a uh, tough Uzbekistanian uh, Israel Madrimov, champion of the WBA. And let's just say that this fight, in my opinion, was uh, not what I expected because I think I think not not many people expected it to be the way it panned out to be because, in my opinion, I was expecting Madrimov to be a bit more reckless, you know, lunging in more, leaping, trying to risk uh, hurting Crawford, you know, knowing that he's the bigger fighter. But at the end, we ended up getting a more calculated, more high-level type of boxing from both fighters. And, I mean, personally for me, I enjoyed the fight. But, I mean, Crawford was able to get the victory. And, I mean, a lot of people were, you know, divided opinions about it. Regardless of them, what are your guys' thoughts about the fight? Yeah, like you said, it was a, it was a close fight. And I don't think a lot of people expected this chess match type of fight. I think... Uh, a lot of people writing off Israel Madrimov, and he showed up. Really good game plan. He showed patience when he needed to. The fight was very slow-paced. You know, both fighters. Crawford is obviously is a counterpuncher, so he wanted to counterpunch. He was waiting for Israel to lunge in like he usually does in his fights, and Israel did not do that. He was uh, doing a lot of feints, you know, staying on the outside, and he landed some great right hands on Crawford throughout the whole fight. I think the it was it was kind of crazy to see the division online about some people saying that Israel Madrimov won. It was a close fight. It was very competitive, but I think the clear victory was Terrence Crawford. He definitely deserved the win, and uh, I, th I thought it was very funny when Eddie Hearn got in the ring, got on the mic, and started saying to the uh, boxing public that uh, those scorecards were horrendous. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, I'm not really surprised, you know, that the fight went the way it did, you know, very much a chess match, very much uh, just high uh, level boxing that we saw in there. I mean, you know, Madrimov, you know, he's he got into the ring, you know, him being the champion, but he was going up against the number, in my in my opinion, the number one, uh, the number three ranked pound for pound fighter. So, I mean, for him to start lunging and do stuff like that, that would have been uh, incorrect or that would have been like, I would have been surprised if he was doing mistakes like that or, you know, doing things like lunging in, uh, uh, what do you call it, not setting up his punches. You know, I think he, he had a pretty good game plan. You know, he kind of stuck to it. You know, uh, the right hand was there all night. You know, Crawford couldn't really uh, neutralize that right hand, which, which is kind of surprising a little bit. Um, so he did get touched up a little bit, but I, I feel like at the end of the day, you know, I feel like the, the uh, Crawford did win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my uh, oh, Israel Madrimov. You know, one of the things I did like from him uh, was his his feints. You know, his upper body movement as well as his footwork was on was on point last night, and uh, 
that's what gave Crawford the, the most trouble throughout the fight. You know, Crawford, like you said, is a natural counterpuncher. So he was waiting for Madrimov to make the move and make the mistake. So in order to capitalize and punish him. But Madrimov, as a way to counter that, you know, as a way to counter the counterpuncher was to to make to do the, to do his feints. You know, the herky jerky, very unorthodox type of uh, uh, upper body feints that he was doing on Terence Crawford. And I mean, Crawford, in my opinion, never really was able to adjust him you know, or adjust to it. Would never really was able to get much of his timing down. Uh, very difficult fight for Crawford. I mean, a lot of people. I think, in my opinion, are downgrading Crawford a lot just based on how he looked last night because I feel people were expecting to see the same Terrence Crawford who showed up against Earl Spence to show up against Israel Madrimov, which, you know, anything less than that performance, people were going to start hating. And that's what I'm seeing online, you know. Scoring the fight, I had Crawford winning the fight 8-4. I think Israel Madrimov, though he did do a good job, uh, uh, you know, neutralizing a lot of what makes Terrence Crawford Terrence Crawford I felt that his lack of activity uh really did uh you know hurt him at the end of the day you know those early rounds I was just picking Crawford the entirety of the of the first half of the fight you know I didn't really see much from Israel Madrima besides you know the feints the herky-jerky style and the constant pressure but I mean Terrence Crawford had that elite jab that he's known for and he was able to you know at least be active you know during those close rounds where not much action was happening and that's why I had I edged it towards Crawford and I was very surprised when a lot of people online were saying that it was you know a closer fight than what I anticipated it to be yeah that's a, a very big uh boxing fan logic you know if Terrence Crawford doesn't dominate if he doesn't completely wipe out his opponent then he lost or he didn't do good or people are downgrading him now in the pound for pound list like you said I find that a bit interesting because um I don't think he was pound for pound number one uh fighter in the world right now um definitely after his win against Errol Spence he was but I mean it's been a year since he's fought inactivity does play a role in uh pound for pound rankings I think uh, Usyk and Inoue have done enough to surpass him. So going into this fight, I did see Terrence Crawford as number three pound for pound. And with this victory over Israel Madrimov, him becoming a four-division world champion, um, I think he still maintained the, the third spot. You know, I think f for a lot of people, it was interesting because they had Crawford number one pound for pound going into the fight. And then now they had to downgrade him maybe to three or four, you know, around there because definitely it shows yeah he he he's a good fighter but i don't think he is pound for pound number one right now yeah i feel like it's it's all about perspective i feel like a lot of casuals still tuned in because you know they watched him fight uh the crawford they watched uh crawford destroy errol spence and then now they're expecting something similar to uh up against a guy like madrimov who had what 10 fights so i figured maybe they thought that he was just going to be able to steamroll over him or, or whatnot but you know it, that's not what that's what that's not what happened and so yes uh, Madrimov is a decent opponent. Uh, uh, he was the champion, and you know, even though Crawford moves up in weight, becomes a four-time uh, world champion in a four and in, in another weight division. Uh, yeah, I still have him as, as number three. You know, I feel like in a way, and and uh, Usyk has have done more, and you know, just personally for me, that's why I have him. You know, ahead of uh, of Crawford. But going back to what you were saying about uh, people were being a little bit more. Uh, would you call it? Uh, maybe they weren't in agreement with the scorecards. Do you guys feel like uh, the scorecards were right? The, what the what the judges had? I I I was I completely agreed with all of them. You know, I had like I said, my personal scorecard was eight of four in favor of Terence Crawford. Uh, one of the judges had it eight of four. You know, one sixteen, one twelve, and then the two others had it what seven to five, one fifteen, one thirteen. It was a close fight. I mean, there's a lot of rounds, competitive rounds, and I mean. I just saw Terence Crawford utilize his his jab being a bit more active, unlike uh, Madrimov in the early first half of the fight, which is why I inched it more towards Terence Crawford at the end of the day. Yeah, I had no problems with the scorecards. Uh, a lot of people, and Eddie Hearn was pointing this out, you know, we actually got the scorecards. He took a picture, and I think he tweeted it out on X saying absolute disgrace or something like this. I, I don't think it was an absolute. I mean, eight eight rounds to four, seven rounds to five. That's a close fight, you know. A 7 to 5 scorecard is just one round difference away from a draw. 
So that's that's as close as one can get to being a victory. So I don't have a problem with the scorecards. I thought they were pretty good. The fight was pretty difficult to score at sometimes. You know, a lot of these rounds they weren't a lot of action. I know both fighters did not land a triple digits um, at the very end of the fight. Neither fighter did. So yeah, it was it was slow paced. It was competitive. I think Crawford did enough to edge the rounds, and specifically the the final two rounds, the championship rounds, Crawford showed up, and I think he cemented that he was the one that was winning the fight in those last two rounds, and that's why he got the victory. Look, I was, I'll was i be the first one to admit, I mean, last week when we gave our, our predictions, I was predicting Crawford to absolutely dismantle Israel Madrimov, and, you know, watching the fight this past weekend, you know, I'm, I'm glad uh, Majumov made me eat my words. You know, he did a lot better than I was expecting him to. Uh, and he displayed high IQ himself. I mean, Crawford was never able to get, you know, any combinations out except in the final two rounds. But, I mean, Crawford was coming in with a, what, 11 fight KO streak. You know, hadn't been to a decision in I don't know how many years. And people were downgrading Madrimov mainly because of his uh, lack of experience. They're like, oh, Crawford has 40-some fights compared to Madrimov's, what, 10, 11 fights. Uh, this is going to be a huge mismatch, yada, yada. And Madrimov showed that, hey, man, like, I can, you know, he wasn't scared at all. I, he he went toe-to-toe with a former number one pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. And he showed that, you know, he he's a legitimate threat still at 154 and i'd favor him against a lot of the 154 pounders based on what i saw this past weekend uh now the question is now what's next for terence crawford uh does he you know uh during his post-fight interview or the press conference the uh, one of the reporters asked asked him about you know a rematch with earl spence which terence crawford said no and then ended the, the press conference <laughs> there uh so it seems that Terence Crawford is not, you know, at all paying attention to a rematch with Earl Spence. But now that he's at 154, you know, uh, Turkey or Your Excellency was speaking about how he wants to make, you know, if the Canelo fight doesn't happen between Canelo and Crawford, he's looking at uh, uh, Crawford and the winner of Serhi Bohochuk or Virgil Ortiz, which they fight this coming weekend. Uh, what's next for Terence Crawford though at 154? Because he has a lot of options. I mean, it's up to him. He he's said it multiple times. He's doing whatever the hell he wants to do. He, I think it's a good decision to stay at 154. Um, 147 division. There's really only one guy that we really want to, or the fans would want to see, or a big fight, and that's against Boots Ennis, of course. But I think Crawford has made it clear that he is not interested in a Boots Ennis fight. So I think he's going to stay at 154, man. I think he's going to try to unify, maybe take a a slight tune-up, you know, at 154, maybe a strong contender, not a world champion. But I know one thing for sure is I don't think he's going to take the Canelo fight anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this showed him 154, these guys are starting to get big. These guys are starting to get strong. These guys, you know, they don't they don't um, react the same way to Crawford's punches as, as they did at 140 and 147. So... He displayed good counter punches at points. He landed some good shots, and Majumov completely ate them, com- kept on coming forward. Terrence Crawford himself said, uh, yeah, this, this guy's strong. This guy's real <laughs> strong. And if you think Israel Majumov is strong at 154, best believe that a Canelo at 168 is going to be much, much stronger. Yeah, uh, you know, with the question with uh, what's next for Crawford, I, um, I think Crawford is just going to go back to the – I think right now Crawford is just going to take a long break, you know, how, you know what he typically does. And I feel like his next opponent, uh, it's probably going to be at 154. I think now he's realizing that even though uh, during the weigh-in and during the fight, Crawford didn't look small. He looked like he did, he belonged in there. But I feel like now he's starting to realize, like, yo, me moving up in weight, like, I'm starting to realize some of these guys are just are going to be able to take my punches. You know, they're not going to react the same way at 140, 147. So, yeah, I think he's going to uh, relax and maybe just stay there at 154. Because, I mean, I feel like there's a ton of stylistic matchups at 154 that are, like, so interesting i mean you got uh tim zhu who is an uh, absolute killer going forward heavy puncher uh we have a uh, sebastian fundora it's a six foot seven i don't even know six foot four super tall guy 154 all these are super interesting we got uh boha check virgil ortiz there's many many opportunities for crawford to fight Eric Lubin as well. Eric Lubin. No. Hammer time, yeah. There's a lot of stuff to, for Crawford at 154. The thing is, he is 37. 
So we're only going to see, you know, a couple more fights, a couple more years of Terrence Crawford. He, I don't think he has the time to completely clear off all the fighters at 154. So we just have to appreciate what we have while we have him in the sport. Mm -hmm. So uh, Terrence Crawford with the UD victory uh, sparked some division online. Uh, but personally for me, uh, it's the right decision. Eight of four for me. Terrence Crawford officially becomes a forward weight division champion. And is looking at, you know, maybe unification at 154 against the other champions uh, sometime in the near future. Hopefully not too long. Hopefully not over a year break that he typically does. <laughs> but hopefully we get to see him early on next year. Uh, but moving down the scores or moving down the card, we had the uh, co-main event. And, you know, last uh, last episode, I was predicting a, uh, a fight of the a fight of the night type of fight. And what we got was something different, man. Uh, we got a completely different fight than I think everyone was expecting. Uh, Pitbull Cruz, uh, WBA champion, was going in as the big favorite against Rayo Valenzuela, who's coming off a uh, K of the Year contender against Chris Colbert last year at 135. So Rayo's coming up, making his debut at 140, and was looking as the as the uh, as the big underdog coming up against uh, Pitbull Cruz. And I mean, let me just say that. Rayo really surprised me, you know, not based on his, you know, he did a good job inside the ring, you know, boxing and everything. But what, what really surprised me the most about him was his discipline to stick to the game plan. Because it was clear from the first round all the way to the end that him and his team had a clear a game plan that they had implemented for uh, Pitbull Cruz. Their sparring partner was Oscar Duarte, man. Uh, which is a great sparring partner as they uh, uh, as it's in preparation for a fighter like Pitbull Cruz. So, uh, in my opinion, Rob Valenzuela rightfully won this fight. I'm glad they didn't take it from him. It was a split decision. I was very surprised the scorecard was that much, but uh, I thought Ryo did enough to win it. And now we have officially a new WBA 140 world champion on the scene. So, what are your guys' thoughts about that fight? Yeah, it was a uh, it was it was interesting. It was a good fight. I, or I don't know if it was. I enjoyed the fight, but it was definitely wasn't the fight that I expected. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were talking about, man. I was really banking on this being the fight of the night. Like, I, I thought this fight was going to be fireworks from the beginning. And um, Pitbull Cruz, for 12 rounds, tried to make it a, a fight of fireworks, you know. He's a... Uh, He's a guy that, in his mind, there's only one one thing to do, and that's throw haymakers after haymakers, right? But Rayo Valenzuela did amazing. He did a great job. He's staying on the outside, doing lateral movements, um, escaping the ropes, and really neutralizing a lot of Pitbull Cruz's combinations. You know, I saw Pitbull Cruz really ineffective, really inefficient. He wasn't able to cut off the ring. He wasn't able to, he, you know, he, he, he was able to land some combinations because, or land some punches because he throws combinations. So he, he'd, he'd get a hook in there sometimes, you know, he'd land some good shots, but they were few and far between. Raya was boxing amazing outside with the jab, waiting for Pitbull to overextend like he always does. And he got an amazing victory. You know, now he's a world champion at 140. You saw the emotion in his in his uh, face after he got the decision. So I'm, a, I'm super happy for Rayo. You know, I was expecting Pitbull Cruz to win relatively easily by KO. But for um, I'm still a fan of Rayo. So I'm happy that he got the victory. I'm happy that he's a world champion. He accomplished his dreams. You know, good for him. Ha, 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 ha. Follow my mistake in last week uh, <laughs> when I uh, gave my prediction. I, I gave my prediction for uh, Rayo, and uh, I didn't really. Uh, I, I said it uh, last week. The only way Rayo could win if he boxed and, and if he fought on the back foot, counter punching uh, Cruz, and he did it. But what surprised me the most is that he was able to uh, prolong that the whole fight, all twelve rounds. Even in in the last uh, round, he was still uh, just boxing, try, trying to touch him. Uh, not trying to uh, really exchange, not trying to get into a firefight, which uh, that was my uh, my worry, you know, because I was going for Ryo. But no, he, he stuck he stuck to it, so you know, good for him. Uh, funny enough, though, uh, I, I was looking online, and I feel like this fight, a lot of people were divided. Uh, the great Juan Manuel Marquez, the great uh, Mexican legend, he thought that uh, Pitbull had won. He actually thought that uh, he was robbed. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I saw just some other comments saying that you know Pitbull. And I know his team was uh, was very vocal, especially his, uh, Pitbull's father, very vocal, saying that uh, they got robbed. But I feel like at the end of the day, um, Pitbull Cruz, he still has quite a bit of, uh, maybe not quite a bit of uh, work to be done, but against boxers, you know what I'm saying? Like, I take this fight with Ryle, you know, and I compare it with uh, uh, a previous, op- not not a previous opponent, but uh, a former opponent, uh, Giovanni Cabrera. Giovanni Cabrera, uh, he was just boxing Cruz, boxing him uh, the whole fight, and Cruz couldn't find a way to cut him off. He, you know, he has a hard time cutting off uh, guys who who move well using those legs, lateral movements and whatnot. And I think Raya took a little page out of that fight and impl- implemented it uh, when he fought Cruz. Yeah, this uh, this fight, you know, it, it, it tells me this the same story that I've always, you know, known about Pitbull Cruz, that his kryptonite is, you know, pure slick boxers. You know, I mean, Raya Valenzuela isn't really known as a pure slick boxer. He's known, more known as a flashy, you know, uh, there to bring it a knockout artist yeah knockout artist in that sense so i mean if Raya valenzuela is able to box you then i can understand why you ducked a fight against shakur stevenson i mean shakur would have absolutely 12 and 0 this man i'm telling you right now yeah there's a reason why pippo cruz and his team uh ducked multiple times uh, a shakur stevenson fight and I mean, it was in full full display this this past weekend. You know, Raya Valenzuela just kept on turning them, just kept on moving, just jabbing them. Was he was just making points? You know, just just not loading up on his punches. I mean, he was able to catch Cruz with multiple good shots. You know, in between, but there were a few. But throughout the whole fight, he just purely just going around, just boxing them, turning them. And Pitbull, I mean, struggling was even cutting off the ring. At this point, I feel like he should already be, uh, uh, uh you know, at least worked on something like that. I mean, the Geronto Davis fight. Uh, a very tough fight for both fighters. Uh, but the thing that got Javante Davis the win was the fact that he just kept, he just decided to fight on the back foot and just move around. And Pitbull Cruz couldn't uh, uh, cut off the ring. Same with Giovanni Cabrera. Yes, he, he whooped Cabrera. But there was a lot of moments where Cruz just couldn't, you know, implement his style that well. Uh, and now you go to Rayo Valenzuela and Rayo Valenzuela was moving on you. I mean, you look at Rayo Valenzuela and Rolly Romero. I mean, like I said last week, the moments where Rolly Romero started moving and boxing was were the best moments for Rolly Romero. And Rayo Valenzuela probably saw that too. And you know, they took a page out of that <laughs> and decided, you know, you know, the way to beat Rolly or the 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 way to beat Pitbull Cruz is just to box him, just move around because he's just gonna follow you. Mm-hmm. He's not gonna come out, he's not gonna cut off the ring, he's gonna implement pressure, but he's he's just gonna follow you. So if you're just constantly turning them and turning them and turning them, there's nothing he's gonna do. He's uh in Rayo Valenzuela's his own word, Pitbull was a one dimensional fighter. And hmm. he's not wrong, honestly. I mean that that's the thing. It's so easy to beat it's like a it, we already have the blueprints to beat Cruz. You know, we've seen it against Giovanni and then uh, a completely different fight against Roley, right? He looked amazing. He looked devastating. He looked like a killer. Oh, my gosh. The new champion at 140. He's going to reign for a long time. We get Rayo Valenzuela and he just, you know, he. I want to make it clear. He didn't put like a boxing master class on Cruz. No. This fight was close. This fight was competitive. You know, Cruz had rounds for him. Yes, that's very true. But it was just in a lot of moments of the of this fight against Valenzuela, Cruz just looked so one dimensional. Like it, he looked so easy to beat. You just had to turn him. Don't stay on the ropes. Don't exchange. Stay on the outside. And Cruz could not adapt. He didn't adjust for the whole twelve rounds. He made no adjustments. Tried to do the exact same thing he was doing from round one. That's what we're saying. Cruz is just a. Uh, he has a clear weakness, like you guys said, and. If he wants to stay at the elites at 140 and even the elites at 135 or any weight class, he has to work on these weaknesses because it is clear, you know, any opponent going forward should know an easy way to beat Cruz is just to stay on the outside and try to box him. Uh, I know this question was asked to uh, Pitbull Cruz and he was like, uh, they asked him, Chris Mannix asked him, do you want the rematch? And Pitbull was like, yeah, I want the rematch. I want the immediate rematch. Does this fight deserve a, an immediate rematch? Would you guys want to see another rematch? Oh, another fight between them two? I mean, not necessarily. I mean, it wasn't like super entertaining. It wasn't super fun. Um, it wasn't that great of a fight, I'd say, even. Um, but I, I maybe, perhaps, you know, if I don't know what Valenzuela has planned, because, I mean, he's not going down to 135 anymore. No. He's a world champion at 140. 
Um, if I was Valenzuela, I probably would say no. Probably get a couple title defenses um, instead of going in a, going to the uh, rematch route with Cruz. But I, I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Rayo said in the uh, post fight conference that you know he's not one to duck. You know, whoever the fight, whoever the fans want him to fight next, he'll do it. You know, he wants all the smoke at one forty. So it just depends on. I guess on what we say, okay, you know what, <laughs> Rayo, fight uh, Subriel Matias, and then <laughs> <Bro>, fight, <laughs> what? Shut up about Matias, what? bro. You be back, bro, just you get it, exposed. Bro. Subriel <laughs> Matias will be back, man. You know, it's funny, these past few months, the whole uh, 140 division has been switched. Uh, a few months ago, uh, the only person that's still a champion is Teofimo Lopez. The yeah. other three have been switched. Yeah. different uh, champions now that's you know that's it proves how competitive 140 really is i think it's it's definitely the glory division right now or, in boxing or how overrated it is because it is i mean if they're all these champions you know who we who we deemed as the, as the best ones are all mm. losing and getting replaced like that how overrated are they i don't know i guess i suppose but i'd say they're more um I'd say just super competitive because Cruz, I guess, I mean, if you, you could, a lot of people do shit on Cruz, especially after this fight, the same, he's one dimensional in a sense. He is, but he's, a, he's still a very tough guy to beat Valenzuela as well. He's a top quality fighter. You know what I'm saying? He, he can bang. And now he just showed he has some boxing ability. He's, he's a little sl slickness. He can take a couple punches too, because he did take some haymakers from Pitbull Cruz. I think it's, and then with the other champions, I mean, we got Subriel Matias, I ain't gonna lie, he did get exposed. <laughs> he looked, he got, he got absolutely outclassed there. Um, Devin Haney, he got stripped from it from, I don't even know exactly what the reason was. So he didn't even lose to Ryan, but he did lose to Ryan Garcia. Uh, Ryan Garcia did not become champion. Um, Tofima Lopez is the only, is the only champion that's stayed through and through. So this division is just inter in interesting, entertaining. New fighters keep on coming in up to one, from 135. The, a lot of new talent, a lot of strong competitors in 140. Yeah, it should be good. Uh, the 135 division, or 135, the 140 division is uh, clearly one of the best in boxing. I was just making that devil's advocate uh, <laughs> uh, uh, argument for that. But uh, yeah, that was the coming event, which I was expecting fireworks, which we didn't get. But we got a different fight, which was, uh, I guess it, it was good to see something different, I guess, in the aspect of, you know, uh, Rayo Valenzuela really made a name for himself, and he's now officially a champion at 140. Uh, but as we go down the list, uh, we had a heavyweight. You know, the big boys decided to take stage uh, on the undercard. And the first heavyweight fight, heavyweight fight I want to talk about is uh, the return of the destroyer, Andy Reese, as he took on Big Baby Miller. Now, Big Baby Miller was coming off a TKO loss to Daniel Dubois back in December of last year. And Andy Reese was coming off of a, a victory over Luis Ortiz over nearly two years ago. So this was a long layoff for Andy Reese, and he was making his return back to the ring. Now, uh, watching the fight, you know, you know, develop round by round, I was very, very disappointed in what I saw. First off, Andy Reese is clearly not the same Andy Reese. And I don't think we'll ever get the same Andy Reese that showed up in the first Anthony Joshua fight. Uh, this Andy Reese that we have now is a very undisciplined fighter. Uh, a very, he just lacked any type of stamina, lacked any type of uh, explosiveness. His power wasn't on display. Uh, it felt more like a hugging match at points. And Andy Reese seemed to have gassed out after the fifth. You know, of course, he had that hand injury, which he showed after the fight, saying that, oh, I, I hurt my hand. People are saying he broke it. But it doesn't change the fact that he gassed out by the fifth round. I mean, it was apparent from the, after the fifth round, he just absolutely was not the same fighter who was, you know, who started off uh, in the first, second, and third fight or round. So Andy Reese, in my opinion, really disappointed me. Uh, I think that they gave him a very you know a very uh, an early christmas present you know a, a draw because he lost that fight big mm. baby miller as much as i do not like him because he's a cheater he won that fight and i think he was wrongfully robbed of a victory and uh supposedly turkey your excellency said that uh big baby miller won that fight and that he's gonna offer him another big fight so at the end of the day big baby miller ended up winning yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But what are you guys' thoughts about the fight? Yeah, it's funny because uh, for some reason, yeah, Turkey 
His Excellency loves Big Baby Miller. You know, this is his second time on on uh, Riot Seasons uh, card. And um, it looks like he's going to be coming back. I think it's because Miller just always agrees to fights. You know, he, he's he's like, yeah, I'll fight. I mean, he's kind of desperate at this point. Let's be honest here. Yeah. His reputation is destroyed. A lot of uh, the boxing community does not like him. They want to get rid of him. But, I mean, his fight against Danny Dubois, okay, he got whooped. He got stopped in the 12th round. We thought that was over. Tenth. In the 10th round. We, we thought that was over. And then he comes back. And then he fights uh, Andy Ruiz, and he looks pretty good. <laughs> he looks pretty good. I was actually impressed by what Miller was doing. Mm. You know, he invested in the body early. From the second, third round, he was hammering away to Ruiz's body. And I think that definitely played a role in the fight. You know, Andy Ruiz's stamina is always an issue. And with this fight, there's a lot of instances where he looked completely exhausted the the thing is this fight is it's hard to like really factor in it's hard to judge all these factors because oh yes he was he, he got tired you know in the fifth round in the fourth round but he also broke his hand around that time as well so that obviously plays a huge factor in the fight not only physically because you can't even throw it but also psychologically man you're like your 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 hand is just throbbing in the corner every second of the fight you know it's a, it's a it's an interesting predicament to be in so. It's hard for Ruiz, man, but I know for sure I definitely was not a fan of his performance. I think he showed. I think even the commentators were saying this, actually, that um, he weighed in at 274, and that was excluding his his two uh, first fights. That was his second heaviest he's ever been in his career, besides the rematch against Anthony Joshua, Mm. which he was like 285. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, Andy Ruiz, he wasn't in real good, um, he wasn't in good shape. You could tell he wasn't in good shape. Going into fight week, he was eating cheeseburgers, talking about he has no diet, he doesn't need no diet, no nutritionist. I mean, he's living that type of lifestyle. What do we, what do we, what do we expect from his performances stamina wise? You know, it's just going to show up in the fight and it did again. Dang, maybe he was trying to take a page out of Butterbean's uh, uh, diet plan. You know how Butterbean, you know, he was a, uh, I wouldn't say he was a champion, but he was definitely a fighter he, back he in the he, 90s. He was the king of the four-rounders. King yeah. of the four-rounders. Maybe he thought that uh, he was going to get out, uh, get Baby Miller out of there, but turns out not. That's not what happened. Okay, so for my prediction going into this fight, I was I had uh, Reese winning, but it all depended on Andy Reese because he's undisciplined. You know, if... Andy Reese came in in the best shape of his life, you know, slim. Uh, I was like, oh, maybe he was going to take this fight. But uh, Friday, when he weighed in, I was like, oh, my, he is looking pretty big. And Miller looked pretty lean, actually, relatively lean. Uh, he looked like uh, he was still over 300 pounds, but uh, it looked like it was pure muscle. You know what I'm saying? Very toned. And I feel like that played a, a big factor. Uh, Miller's fight was to make the fight very dirty and go to the body. He, and he was banking on that uh, the whole fight, and it paid off at the end. You could say that uh, uh, Andy Reese's right hand was a was a uh, major key as to why uh, he wasn't throwing that, that right hand anymore, why he wasn't throwing combinations. But, you know, if you want to be a champion, or a true champion is uh, can always adapt. Uh, look at uh, Geronta Davis when he fought uh, Pitbull Cruz. He hurt his hand. So what did he do? He adjusted and started just using the other the other hand, the other hand, and you know he got got the win. Andy Reese, he wasn't even using the, the left hand for anything. He was just not really doing much. And I feel like most of it has to do with his conditioning. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think. Um the thing is, it was it was such a funny fight to watch because you know Andy Ruiz is the guy that's known as the combination puncher, and but we saw Miller throwing some beautiful combinations, man. And listen, I like you said, I hate Miller like like the rest of the boxing community. I don't think he should really be boxing, uh, especially in these big cards, these big stages. But you cannot lie, he did win this fight, and he looked pretty damn good in there. So I'm interested to see what he does after, you know, because um, he doesn't really have the the best skills in heavyweight. He isn't really skillful. He's just a big guy that comes forward and likes to fight, and um, that does pose a challenge to a lot of fighters. Um, so I guess now Big Baby Miller is thrown into the heavyweight. Uh, rankings the contenders you know maybe he has opportunities now to fight some some other guys you know he just beat Andy Ruiz unofficially I'd Mm. say
Mm. Well, you know what they should do? Martin Bacoli taking on Big Baby Miller next. <laughs> because let's say this. Go moving down to the uh, last fight I want to talk about from the card. Martin Bacoli, man upset the big baby the other big baby or the real big baby yeah. what he was dubbed as uh jared anderson was upset in the fifth round brutally by martin bacoli uh martin bacoli was going in as the underdog uh against jared anderson and i mean i it, it didn't seem that way during the fight it seemed like big baby anderson was the underdog because martin bacoli just buried him absolutely dismantled him it was brutal uh, since the first round when he dropped him heavy with the uppercut caught him so clean as Jared Anderson was you know in, in midway through his through his punch and uh, the key for Martin Bacoli was the uppercuts man he landed so many crisp uppercuts so many devastating uppercuts and those two uppercuts that he landed uh, that were key were the ones that dropped and hurt big baby Anderson and were the ones that essentially finished him off uh, Martin Bacoli is definitely a guy now that a lot of people have on their radar and i think would be a good matchup for big baby miller uh i, I mean they're both big guys i mean big baby miller was six five six four ish i think is six four three hundred some pounds martin bacoli six six 280 pounds uh their style would definitely clash it'd be a very good fight so uh big before we even get into that uh uh fantasy matchup uh, what are you guys thoughts about martin bacoli as he uh, upset big baby anderson yeah, this is an uh, amazing victory for him, man. He just beat a, a hot prospect from the USA, you know, top ranks heavyweight boxer, and completely destroyed him, dismantled him from the first round. It really wasn't. Um, it really wasn't competitive, and I actually found it a bit. I was actually surprised, you know, Jared Anderson. I never thought that he was going to be an elite guy in the heavyweight division i never saw him like that and the thing is he is very skillful he's fast he's explosive he has good attributes he has good skills but i i just thought i don't know exactly what he's missing and um it, uh, this fight against uh bacoli you know bacoli he, he reminds me uh, there's been a lot of comparisons uh, to george foreman because it's like a nonchalant type of style where he has his hands down. He's kind of squared up as well. And he just throws his punches like from the hip, you know. But it works. It works wonders. I mean, he, he was able to, his punch selection was amazing. Uh, he, he, he utilized the uppercut, which was super effective in the fight. A lot of right hands. And he was actually a pretty active fighter. He threw a lot of punches and he didn't gas out. You know, Jared Anderson showed a lot of heart. From the first round, he got up and he was still game. He was still ready to fight. He still wanted to win. He was still being very quick, trying to be elusive, use his feet. But Martin, Martin Bacoli completely shut that down. Um, I was really impressed. And um, we're going to see a lot of Bacoli uh, fans coming after, after this fight because uh, he got introduced in the world stage. Yeah, he did. I feel like this is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, stage he's ever fought in his entire career. Uh, I feel like a lot of people know him. I feel like now he's kind of like a dark horse. Like, who is this guy? He has an impressive record. 20 wins, or, or I guess now, 21 wins, one loss, 16 KOs. That's an impressive uh, uh, record, uh, you know, for a heavyweight. And he's he's huge. He's like one of the bigger ones. Uh, like, if we're just talking about within the elite at the heavyweights, he, he's 6'6", 280. It's going to be hard for someone to stop that, dude. Uh, in respects with uh, Jared Anderson, Jared Anderson, he is skillful, but I mean, it's like what you said. Uh, I feel like uh, once he was going uh, this fight was, I mean, I know we, we didn't really talk about it uh, the last podcast, but I knew this is going to be like a very much a 50 50 fight or more even like uh, a 60, a 60 40 split in favor of Martin because uh, this was going to be the first time Jared was going to be stepping up in level opposition. So uh, yeah, now uh, it seems as though uh, you know Jared isn't really isn't really isn't really ready for for the elites, and mm. so uh, I guess now he, he had to learn that the hard way. Uh, I know uh, you know Bob Aaron was sitting there, so I guess now he has to go back to the drawing board and see <laughs> what, what he can do with him. Yeah, yeah, that that was the uh, the big thing, you know, coming to the to the fight. I was actually predicting Bacoli to upset. Big baby, and big baby Anderson because I've never been like you said 
I'll say, I've never been sold on Big Baby Anderson myself either. And I've seen a lot of flaws in this game. He doesn't look that impressive whenever they try to step in them up. So when I saw that they were putting them, putting them up against Martin Bacoli, who had, you know, a, a reputation of, of, you know, being the upset king, uh, then I was like, okay, this might be, this Big Baby Anderson might just get upset in this fight. And it, it, it amazes me that it took uh, Turkey or Your Excellency in order for that to happen. Because if it wasn't for him, Martin Bacoli would have never fought Big Baby Anderson because Bob Arum and Top Rank would have never put Big Baby Anderson on a fight against a fighter like Bacoli. They would have kept on feeding him the same type of fighters that he's been feeding, that he's been fed, uh, in order to build up his record, in order to you know sell him as the next uh, USA heavyweight uh, prospect. Because now that Deontay Wilder is essentially gone, USA is in need of a heavyweight fighter, you know, a heavyweight champion. And top rank since the beginning of his career has been trying to build him up as the next USA champion. Hence why they were never going to take a fight against Martin Bocoli if it wasn't for Turkey to step in and make the fight happen. Offered them both, both camps, both fighters, big money in order to make it happen. And I mean... I'm glad that Bacoli was able to win because now people know him and it took this opportunity for people to get to know him. So uh, Jared Anderson, you know, tough guy, uh, big heart, uh, has to get back to the drawing board, has to get back and and reassess what he, you know, what him and his team plan on doing. But Martin Bacoli now, he's uh, essentially a guy who's on the rise and he's what? He's still relatively young. I mean, 32, I believe. So in the heavyweight scheme, you know, in, in the scene, he's young. So he can get big fights if he fights, if he keeps on continuing at this pace. I'm sure that uh, uh, Your Excellency is going to want to keep putting them on the cards uh, that he has coming up. So Marm Bacoli is a name that, you know, a lot of people should, you know, keep their eyes out for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And in regard to Jared Anderson, he's only 24 years old. So he is, thankfully, he's still very young. I, I feel, I think he learned his lesson, man. He was very articulate in the post-fight interview. He seemed his head was on right, which is very surprising because he took some hellacious shots in that fight. So he took it like a man. He said, yeah, he was a better man. May I, I just, I fought the wrong game plan. It is what it is. Sometimes you lose some, you win some. That's a good outlook to have. I, I still have hope for him. You know, he still, he has attributes. And I, I do like Jared Anderson. I, I, I do like him. He does, uh, you know, he, I love his uh, ring walks. You know, he he's always gets creative with those, like a pimp stick or the Grinch or, you know, all, all these type of things. Um, so I think he's good for, for the heavyweight boxing. He's only 24 years old. He still has a lot of time to improve, um, fix up his weaknesses. Because, yeah, like you said, the heavyweight division is kind of interesting. And the fact that you can be like 35 to 37 and you can be like in your prime. You know, we got like Zile Zhang, who is at the top of his career right now. And he is what, 38? 40. He's 40. You know what I'm saying? Like these guys get old. Tyson Fury, another old fighter. Usyk's getting up to like 35. These guys are, are, are in their late 30s performing their best ever. So... Jared Anderson still has 10 more years to perfect his craft. I think it was a good learning experience to get into the fight with Marin Bacoli. So um, he will learn a lot, and hopefully he comes back. Yeah. Also, that was fight of the night. I think it was. That was fight of the night. Best fight, man. Yeah. That was like real. The people were saying, this is like 90s heavyweight type of fight, man. (laughs) It was real fight, man. That was a great fight. Yeah, Marin Bacoli got that old school type of heavyweight uh, style. Mm -hmm. So uh, fan fan, fan friendly, and it just, it's entertaining to watch. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that was the. Do uh, you have anything to say, Rudo, about no. the fight? No, no, I'm 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 very much a, a Bacoli fan now, for yeah. sure. I really want to see him again. I want to see who they put him up against now. Yeah, he should be a good one. He should mm. be a very fun fighter. Why people were saying Zile Zhang oh. against Martin Bacoli, JoJo. I mean, JoJo is kind of washed JoJo's up now. Is out yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Derek Chisora coming back. <laughs> Derek Chisora, <laughs> hey, he's coming back now. You know, the heavyweights are so interesting. It's such a funny division to watch. You know, I understand why. Uh, in the old school, you know, it was the golden, it was the golden division. Everyone loved watching heavyweight boxing uh, because it, it is very entertaining. And Martin Bacoli, you know, if he keeps on producing these type of knockouts, um, he's just going to continue to gain popularity and eventually uh, maybe even fight for a world title. Mm. Yeah, hopefully we get to see more of Martin Bacoli sometime soon and, and maybe in the next uh, uh, card, Rehot card. Uh, but I mean, those were all the fights I kind of wanted to go over from the from this past uh, Madrimov and Terence Crawford card. 
uh is there anything else oh actually before we even i want to switch gears for a mm. little bit give our thoughts about the influencer scene yes uh this past weekend as well we had ksi announced that he's no longer going to be participating in the 2v1 against uh slim and anthony taylor and that sparked a lot of debate online on in the influencer scene especially from slim you know saying essentially that like oh like he's scared stuff like that <laughs> Uh, what are your guys' thoughts about that? K-Side supposedly didn't disclose his injury mm. or what he couldn't do, but he said that he just wasn't able to perform uh, in his camp because of the injury. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts about that? I mean, it must be a, a, a pretty serious injury because uh, he was talking that he couldn't, he couldn't spar, he couldn't hit the heavy bag, he couldn't hit pads, I think. These are pretty basic stuff that you have to do in boxing. So, I mean, if you can't do that, then you're not going to get in shape for a boxing fight. Um, I did find it a bit interesting that he didn't disclose his injury. I think, because the, the thing is, if if KSI, since KSI didn't disclose it, now there's a lot of theories. Now there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying he's just ducking. A lot of people saying he's not even injured. He's lying. He doesn't want to fight. Yada, yada, yada. So for, for KSI, I feel like he should have just disclosed his injury, maybe shown some, I don't know, shown the injury or something, and people would have been like, okay, you know, maybe he, he is telling the truth. Mm. Now people are saying he's just lying and he doesn't want to fight Slim. Um, this whole fight, I was never a big fan of it from the very beginning. You know, I, th I thought the 2v1 concept is overplayed and it doesn't really give any credibility to KSI to fight Slim or Anthony Taylor in the uh, in a 2v1 style. Um, so in that sense, I am kind of a bit happy that it, it's, uh, it got canceled. <laughs> you know, maybe he reconsiders and actually finds a better opponent, a more suitable opponent. So, but yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was a bit, um, I wouldn't say I'm surprised because the posters started getting taken down like a week or two weeks ago. So there was already speculation that this fight was being canceled. It got proven right, and KSI is injured. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, let, let's go on the, on the conspiracy theory train. Uh, for me, uh, yeah, KSI pulled out. Uh, but I don't think he pulled out because he's scared of either Slim or AT. You know, I feel like you know uh, KSI is the guy who would fight anyone, you know. But I think this is where my theory comes in. I feel like the reason why he isn't taking this fight is because uh, it's not going to really do well. I think that's the reason why, you know, I feel like, uh, especially Anthony Taylor but in, in Slim, they're not really, uh, they don't really have that selling power. You know what I'm saying? It's all KSI. And I feel like maybe he was starting to realize that uh, it wasn't going to do well. Mm. So I think maybe he decided to pull out mm. Yeah, because, I mean, we still, we still have yet to know what kind of injury he sustained mm -hmm. while in training camp. Yeah. Um, yeah. The thing is, I mean, he is, thankfully, he's such a big name that he, he could probably carry the card himself. I know they, they uh, rented out, what, Wembley or O2? No, it's oh. uh, it's in uh, Ireland. Oh, really? Ireland uh -huh. card. Yeah. That's interesting. I thought, yeah. wow, that's that that's actually interesting. I, I don't know why he's fighting in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> different. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's different. different. Um, it's for like the two-year anniversary. So. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough now. I, I, I don't know how big the stadium is that Misfits rented out, but they're, uh, you know, headlining was ksi now ksi isn't headlining who the hell is gonna headline you know i know uh, ksi offered uh, full full refunds to the fans and if i was a fan i would definitely get that refund <laughs> because you know i'm going there to watch ksi i'm not going there to watch any other fight that they can conjure up but you don't want to see him perform Oh, oh yeah. yeah, he's gonna be like singing or rapping. Or whatever. So he's 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 in, he's too injured to hit pads, but he's not injured enough to you know perform a full performance. Another conspiracy theory. <laughs> 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 nah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I mean, like you said, I wasn't a big fan either of the two v one. Also, I think it would have been. If anything, it would have been slightly slightly better if he would have done like a 1v1, like, you know, KSI against Slim or KSI, not, maybe not Anthony Taylor, but KSI against Slim would have been a, a better concept than a 2v1. Regardless, I think that him fighting any of these influencer fighters being Slim or Saul Poppy, I think it's a big downgrade for him. I, I believe he's at a level that he should be fighting... Uh, at least some bigger names, not influencer. You know, Amir Khan would have been a good one. Oh yeah, the one that they were they're trying to you know cook up, because uh, uh, you look at Jake. I mean, if if he's 
Okay, it all comes back to Jake Paul. Like, it also, like it, that's that's what it is. It all comes back to Jake Paul. Jake Paul has already made it clear that he's doing his own thing. You know, he's gonna keep on boxing until the day he maybe dies or whatever, where he passes away. He he grows old and retires. So Jake Paul's gonna keep boxing. KSI, like he's always said, it, 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 "Oh, I'm gonna retire when I beat Jake Paul." Are you gonna stick to that promise or not? And if you are gonna stick to that promise, then you're gonna have to up your 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 opponents, man. You can't be continuing fighting you know influencers uh face temper uh slim at you know salt poppy even like you can't be fighting these guys if your goal is to beat jake paul in order for you to retire uh so when i heard the 2v1 was against them i was like one 2v1 stupid uh second these two guys really like it's not a good credible name for you man you're literally like downgrading your opponents so i'm glad this fight isn't going to going along i hope ksi you know if he does have a serious injury i hope he does recover but uh i hope that you know once he does recover and is able to start training again properly uh that they find him a good suitable uh, opponent you know someone who's credible someone who's going to give him credibility someone who's going to at least be able to push him and uh you know it's going to be a bigger big credible name than beating slim or at i think i have the perfect name honestly mm. Tyron Woodley. He's always there, man. He is a cornerstone in every singer in every single influencer trying to make it big. I'm telling you right now. He's like Volk in the UFC, bro. Exactly. <laughs> you call him last minute notice, he will be there. But I say this jokingly, but also partly true. I think for like you said, if KSI wants to make this uh fight with Jake Paul reality. He has to change something, you know, because Jake Paul now is a completely is out of reach right now. You know, uh, there's really the chatter between them. The fight between them kind of died down. And it's because mainly KSI and the level that he's fighting at right now. He has to I feel he has to take the the Jake Paul route, which is fight old, maybe retired MMA guys, you know, get 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 some of those uh, fights under his belt. Because those are going to be a lot tougher than fighting uh, face temper, you know, or fighting slim. They're going to be a lot tougher, and they're going to give him, they're going to give him some credibility, but they're also going to give him a lot of hate, obviously, just like it happened with Jake Paul. But I think that will increase the tensions and the the um, dance that KSI and Jake Paul always have. I think it will increase, and people will now f finally start to be more interested in seeing a fight like that. Yeah. Um. Theo Vaughn has a podcast, and he invited KSI a couple weeks ago, and I gave it a listen. And uh, KSI, you know, uh, he mentioned a couple of opponents, and one of them being Amir Khan later in the year. So we might see that later. So even though I don't really like it because, you know, Amir Khan has always campaigned in a lower weight class. I know he started, out, I think, at 135, and then he ended his career maybe at 147. So now he would be moving up 40, 40 pounds to fight KSI because KSI is a big boy. Tyrone Woodley, would I would like to see him fight uh ksi that'd be a, a, a good opponent plus um he's also fought uh jake so that kind of gives you uh maybe a baseline as to uh what the levels are between ksi and jake you know how good they are mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's an ex-opponent and if he knocks him out before before jake i don't know in the first second round then oh my gosh ksi did it before jake but then on the same part in the other half of the coin it's like oh he's beating up jake sloppy seconds sir <laughs> he already beat him you know it's that's old news for jake you know you have to, you have to have both of those sides to to really start getting the conversation started again for ksi and jake paul so i think that is a good fight honestly yeah so that was the big uh, big news in the influencer scene. Uh, KSI pulling out of the fight due to injury. Hopefully he comes back, and hopefully they find a better opponent. You know, Tyron Woodley, maybe. I mean, him and Mams Taylor linked up recently at a PFL uh, event uh, okay. this past week. And so, I mean, maybe Mams Taylor was all like, hey, how would you like a, uh, a KSI payday, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you already know Tyron was like, yeah. hell yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm listening. <laughs> like, send me the contract right now. I'll sign it. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, well, that was our, uh, you know, our thoughts and opinions about first off the Crawford and Israel Madrimov, uh, as well as the entire card. What you guys think about that? Do you guys think that Crawford did enough to win, or was this quote unquote a disgrace, like all these uh, uh, people are saying online? Also, let us know about the co-main event about Pipo Cruz and Rayo Valenzuela. 
Do you think that Rayo Valenzuela did enough to win the fight? Do you think, uh, you know, what's next for both fighters? You know, is Pitbull Cruz still guaranteed a Gervonta Davis rematch? Or does Rayo Valenzuela now earn that shot at Gervonta Davis sometime in the near future? And also let us know about everything about the card. You know, what, what was your fight of the night? Who was the fighter to watch? What was the biggest uh, disappointment of the card? Let us know everything that you guys are thinking down in the comment section, as well as liking and subscribing to the channel and following us on all forms of social media. We are on X, TikTok, and Instagram. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on our Discord. We are trying to build up a community, and everything that I said is down in the link in the description below. But this was Pablo, and I am with Rudo and Asa, and this is The Last Round Podcast. Thank you for watching.